Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Amatya Sen, who is the Lamont Professor of Economics and Philosophy at Harvard, a university professor, uh, the 1998 Nobel Laureate in Economics, a fellow at Trinity College in England, and he is visiting the Berkeley campus as the 2005 Hitchcock Lecturer. Professor Sen, welcome to Berkeley. Well, thank you very much. Where were you born and raised? Well, I was born in Bengal, what was then undivided India, um, about 100 miles off Calcutta in a place called Shantiniketan, which is an academic establishment where Rabindranath Tagore, the poet, had established a school and then later it became an institute of higher education um, where I also studied. But my family comes from Dhaka, which is now the capital of Bangladesh. Mm. But I was born in the maternal par parents, um, uh, the maternal grandparents' home, which was in Santa Niketan. So I can, then went back to Dhaka when I was extremely tiny, I guess. <laughs> Looking back, how did your parents shape your thinking about the world? Well, the, I mean, the family was rather academic. I, my father was professor of chemistry, my grandfather was professor of Sanskrit. So, you know, there was a lot of um, academic um, prejudice within the family, as <laughs> it were, regarding that as a natural form of life. I was born in the campus. Uh, of Shantiniketan, in fact, and spent most of my life in one campus or another. And uh, my parents have too, so uh, in a sense the, um, that was one of the things, a close uh, association. But my father was, of course, a scientist, was a chemist, and who did first physics and maths and then did chemistry. So there was a kind of interest in, in science which I had, but my grandfather maternal grandfather being a Sanskritist. I had a lot of interest also in, uh, in history and in culture and, and classics and I did Sanskrit before I did English. Um, so uh, it's, uh, I think there was a kind of general interest in academic matters both on scientific side as well as literary and cultural side. My mother actually, uh, who still is, is, uh, you know, is alive and uh, is 92 now, but she is um, um, uh, uh, somewhat uh, reduced by age, but still edits a magazine. Uh, mm. And in her youth, well, had been a quite a well-known dancer actually. Um, uh, but uh, that was many, many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, in your biography in, uh, for the, the Nobel Prize Committee, uh, you, you emphasized uh, the high quality and distinctiveness of, of your pre-collegiate education in India, a place where you really developed a curiosity and, and came to understand the importance of thinking as opposed to making grades. Yes, high quality, one has to qualify that. That is, in terms of being an exacting school where you did everything, um, you know, as uh, in, in as um, extended a form as possible. Um, in, judged in that standard, Santinikatan wasn't a, a high quality place. In fact, things were very relaxed. Uh, there was very little pressure on you to do anything. If you didn't want to do much, then you didn't do, do, do much. So it was high quality and having a rather different philosophy of education, which involved a lot more freedom, a lot more choice, a lot more uh, interest in the whole world. Um, you know, not just India, nor just the imperial Britain, but also China and Japan and Malaysia and Indonesia and Thailand and uh, on one side and similarly Middle East and Africa and, and the other European cultures also quite a bit and a fair amount of interest in the United States. So we had a kind of internationalism. The institution is called Vishwa Bharati. Vishwa is world, Bharati is knowledge. So the motto of it, and the name of it, indicates uh, trying to capture knowledge across the world. So there was internationalism, 
there was a, a great deal of emphasis on thinking independently. And in these respects, uh, yes, it was a distinguished school. On the other hand, uh, I think a lot of my classmates uh, similar, you know, in the same year in Calcutta or even Dhaka would have had, would have known much more in terms of the standard school curriculum than we did because the focus wasn't on that. Mm -hmm. Given this background, was it uh, uh, was it inevitable? Do you think that your the focus of your uh, your life's work would be ideas and the importance of ideas? I don't know that anything is inevitable in that <laughs> sense in life, but uh, it probably did influence me. Uh, certainly, um, but you know, we were. Uh, I've been, even though I'm. I thrill at uh, hearing and reading about great ideas. Um, my life has also been somewhat involved in, with action, of course. Mm -hmm. um, I was interested in politics and I was interested in activities of various kinds, including the Nobel gave me a chance to start two trusts, one in India and one in Bangladesh, dealing particularly with elementary education, elementary health care and gender equity. And I've been very active in, in, in that research in, in that area too, and, and intervention. And also since I was for three years um, honorary president of Oxfam, uh, that as you know is not a, uh, I mean it, it has a high ideology, but it's also an, an institution of, of action and it's an NGO which is present in nearly everywhere in the world. And I was very, um, very privileged to be associated with Oxfam, which I still am, and a long honorary president, I'm honorary advisor of them. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, yes, ideas, but uh, quite a lot of the ideas have been concerned with action from various kinds, um, you know, across the globe. Uh, a lot of it in India and Bangladesh, but quite a lot of it outside too. The, it sounds like there was a, a, a movement toward uh, a political philosophy and economics as, as uh, there, were, there were many opportunities from what you're describing of the fields you might enter. What, what, uh, what pointed you in that direction? Well, I think, uh, I mean, it wasn't an easy decision. I mean, I was, since my, since I went to school at a place where my maternal grandfather, who was a Sanskritist, was teaching. Uh, I was um, really, really, very involved in classical education right from the beginning. I started doing Sanskrit when I was three, really. And um, so I had a lot of interest in classic, but I also liked maths a lot. And initially, in that battle, I uh, thought that I might actually end up being a mathematician and a physicist, which is how I began uh, the end of my school years and early college, but then shifted to economics and actually political philosophy too, but that came somewhat more slowly later. I think I was involved in student politics, which played a part in that. I was concerned with um, kind of academic propensity to generalize about ideas and not particularize about the action that I was involved in. I think that naturally leads, in a sense, to, to, to political philosophy. Uh, that happened rather slowly, and I think the development of political philosophy interests was not in the first days of college, which I had in Calcutta in Presidency College, where I was doing mainly economics, economics and maths. I move, having moved from maths and physics, I was doing maths and economics. And, but then later on, when I went to Trinity College, Cambridge, and continued to do economics, but economics seemed, didn't seem very exacting in, in, in Cambridge at that time. And uh, I had a fair amount of spare time, and I got involved with doing philosophy generally, initially also um, um, philosophy of science and epistemology, but uh, ultimately got very settled on political and moral philosophy. How, how do you compare doing theorizing in economics versus doing it in political uh, philosophy? At one time, that universe was combined in, in, uh, in, in, in the world of ideas, but uh, it, it, at least in, in the United States, in the West, there, there is a, a more marked division, although some people cross over and so on. Are there differences in the way you think as you do these two disciplines? I, I think probably there is. I would say 
couple of things. First of all, there is a much greater, depending on whether you're friendly or unfriendly, you would describe it, uh, that commitment to or mm. obsession with, depending on whether you <laughs> like it or not, mm. with uh, quantification and with, um, with making a very precise statement in economics than you have in political philosophy. I think most political philosophers tend to, would tend to think that the great ideas in the world uh, are not one where precision is the most important thing. I think liberty, equality, and fraternity are not bursting with precision, but they're certainly bursting with relevance and they, they, the way they impact on our lives. So I think there is a certain amount of division about what makes something rigorous. Um, the, I think political philosophers would tend to think that the, ex the type of rigor is, is very different in the subject. It's a point that Aristotle makes very early, that every subject has its own level of precision. And I think there there is a difference between the standard way the economists tend to think and the standard way the philosophers tend to think. I think the other thing is that possibly it's right to say that economists have been rather um, dominated by schools of thought. Mm -hmm. So that if there is a line of reasoning that becomes well established, mm -hmm. um, whether it be you know general equilibrium theory as it's called, a, a kind of market-based thing, thinking of everything in terms of analogy with market or anything else, and you know people uh, quite often as making the assumption that people are just self-interested and trying to fit everything in the world into it. I think there's a presumptive difference in the sense that economists often incline. Uh, to assume that if there is a departure, but your first thought is, can I somehow accommodate it mm -hmm. by making the model a bit more complicated? And I think often political philosophers won't go in that direction. And mm -hmm. uh, there I'm not sure that I entirely agree with the mainstream e economics approach, because I think trying to fit things in and taking, as it were, your established understanding as the default program to which you return if you cannot resolve. Not always, I think, the best way of understanding, not only political problem, but even economic ones. Now, I, since I have sort of um, um, run around between these different disciplines a certain amount, I, I, I take a considerable um, uh, I, I owe a considerable gratitude to, to the, the concern that economics had with analytical and rigorous reasoning. And yet, uh, I think there is something um, uh, that the political philosophers teach us, which may be of relevance to economics too, mm -hmm. namely not to be too hung up on precise statement. After all, there's a whole maths of uh, incomplete orderings, partial orders, uh, fuzzy sets, um, precisely defined ambiguities of measurement, in which I think economists perhaps ought to take more interest. Political philosophers, of course, typically don't go in the direction of mathematizing it, but in so far as economists are concerned with mathematizing it, there's a whole area of mathematics which can find bigger use in economics than in fact it tends to, to get. And um, so I think in many ways um, my own work has, and focus have ended up being a little off-center mm -hmm. from economics. And yet um, I think it's, um, I hope it's strongly influenced by the um, economic modes of thinking as well as insight that has come from political philosophy. I hope so, anyway. For, for a layman, myself, a reader of your work, there, there seems to be a, a, a very nice synergy in the sense that one, one has the sense that in, in, in what I've read that you, you've used political philosophy to broaden the perspective of economics when dealing with a particular problem. And I, that, that's a gross simplification, but, but one, one, one definitely sees the the energy that comes from the interaction between yeah. the two in your work. I don't know whether it's a gross simplification, but it may be a little simplification. But you know, as you mentioned a few minutes ago, that at one stage economics and political philosophy was much closer. Mm -hmm. After all, the, the founder or the person who had the greatest claim to be regarded as the founder of modern economics, Adam Smith, was professor of moral philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, rather than uh, in, uh, rather than professor of economics, and I think in um, that connection is still quite strong. So I don't, I have not had a sense of really 
going outside the boundaries of my subject, as it were. Uh, I mean, I'm very keen on interdisciplinary research, but what is sometimes described as interdisciplinary is in fact just a broader view of the discipline rather than uh, seriously getting out of your you know, mm -hmm. field and, and, and looking. I mean, when you're doing, I don't know, using evolutionary biology in order to understand economic problem, I think that is clearly interdisciplinary. But when you're bringing in a broader conception of human being who is concerned not only with his or her own life, but also with the lives of others, commitment to them, concern about them, and so on. Uh, that doesn't strike me as quintessentially outside the mm -hmm. field of economics. That's what economics is also about, even if some models of economics may not recognize that. And classically, if you think about uh, the subjects, the traditions, uh, Adam Smith, John Stuart Mill, Karl Marx, Francis Edgeworth, I think they've all had very considerable interest in these broader way of characterizing human behavior, human understanding, and human commitment. You, you speak often in your writings about broadening the base of information, which, which has been very important in, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in your discussions of, for example, choice and freedom, uh, a yes. development and freedom, that, that we have to broaden how we see the phenomena under question to get new sources of information to then explain and understand behavior. Yeah. I think there are two issues here. One is sometimes the information on which the, the existing tradition has tended to concentrate and has got used to concentrating may leave out something quite important mm -hmm. which are relevant and which a different line of inquiry might bring out. I mean, for example, when I was working on, say, famines and, and so on, it became quite clear that a food-centered view did not give anything like an adequate understanding of famine. You really have to see it as a much broader problem with strong economic dimension. The markets of all kinds of commodities uh, are important, not just food, because after all you have to earn your income by selling whatever it is that you have to sell, maybe just labor. But whatever it is, you have to sell your interest in the labor market, you're interested in those artisan products which you sell on the basis of which you will buy food. So there's that kind of issue, and as well as a political dimension, namely since famines are very easy to prevent, a democratic society um, makes it obligatory for a government to go in that direction because, uh, you know, uh, uh, elections are not easy to win after a famine and indeed it's not easy to withstand criticism of opposition parties, newspapers and so on in, if you have a democratic system. So it turns out, not a surprise, that uh, there has never been a famine in a democratic uh, society. Now this is not a statement about food, it's a statement about the connection between democracy and famine. So in all kinds of ways, there are these information which are relevant for studying a problem, which might have been left out for those who took a rather narrow understanding of, in this case, famine, just concentrating on food supply and food availability and, and food distribution. The other thing is that sometimes there are um, real um, barriers to broadening our understanding because of high theory. Uh, and this applies very much to philosophy too. Mm -hmm. A very good example would be, say, utilitarianism, which has been perhaps the most dominant mode of thinking for the contemporary world. Um, beginning with Jeremy Bentham, you can trace roots earlier, but Jeremy Bentham probably the big, big point of departure there. But you see, there you not only take into account people's happiness and pleasure and pain and desires and desire satisfaction. But you tend to judge the importance of absolutely everything mm -hmm. um, in terms of the intensity of desire, the intensity of pleasure or happiness. And that actually leaves out a whole lot of things. For example, if you're dealing with societies where there are people systematically deprived and have relatively little hope of redemption, you know, kind of uh, hopelessly precarious landless laborers looking for a little job, uh, overworked domestic servant, um, uh, women in a sexist uh, uh, society in which uh, women have very little freedom. Uh, I think one of the things that, that I did find observing uh, is that 
the underdogs come to terms with their deprivation. So if you're looking at what their desires are, by the time they've cut their desire to shape, it doesn't look as if their desires are being unfulfilled, it's just that their desires have got adapted. Mm -hmm. And similarly, people learn to take pleasure in small mercies. It's always nice to see, you know, how in a terrible state of deprivation, even in famine, people take tremendous joy when they get a little relief, a little food, a little, uh, a little security. And in order to judge how deprived they are, if you went by the utilitarian calculus mm -hmm. of happiness and whether your desires, whatever they are, happen to be fulfilled, you would not recognize how deprived the lives of these people are. You need something a bit more objective than that, a bit more concerned with the actual way their lives are going, what freedoms they actually have. And the fact that it's a lack of freedom that might make them cut their desires to shape and, and train them to take joy in little, little, little reliefs in, in, in an otherwise terrible situation has to be brought in. But I think there you have to broaden the informational base altogether. The utilitarian base is utterly hopeless mm -hmm. in trying to give enough of an insight about the nature of deprivation in the world. You, you've spoken of, of poverty as deprivation of capability, really, yes. because it, it, as it would apply to the exact situation you're describing. That's right. Yeah, I, I think capability is kind of a class of freedom, really, namely what you can actually, what you're able to do. Are you free to lead a um, hunger-free life? It's the first from actually leading hunger-free life, because sometimes, of course, uh, you may actually court hunger if, for example, you're fasting for religious reasons or for political reasons, Mahatma Gandhi fasting. You wouldn't describe the political fast of Mahatma Gandhi against the British Raj as indication that his life is deprived. No, that's mm. a part of his action. So it's not so much whether you're actually hungry, but whether you have freedom to avoid hunger if you chose to. Mm -hmm. uh, in most cases you will choose to, but there are exceptions. So similarly, whether you have freedom to, um, to lead a um, yeah. life um, uh, you know, with um, um, reasonable clothing, reasonable shelter, um, whether you have the freedom to get medical attention when you're ill, uh, whether you have the basis of avoiding premature mortality, uh, or, uh, or escapable morbidity. All these come into the, or for that matter, whether you have the freedom to take part in the life of the community, kind of social capabilities. So all these are actions of functionings, as we sometimes call them, which are important for human life and which we have reason to value, the relative value of which are for us to determine. Uh, but if we don't have the freedom to pursue them, our lives are deprived in some way. Now, poverty defined as lowness of income is a very narrow perspective on that. Certainly, lowness of income tends to, given other things, make us more prone to deprivation of capabilities. But we're not lamenting the lack of income for its own sake. We, we're really concerned with what income allows us to do. But income is not the only factor which affects it. There's so many other things to be looked at if you're living in an epidemiologically uh, nasty region with a lot of epidemics of malaria, cholera, whatever it is, even with the same level of income, your life might be more deprived. You may be less free to avoid these illnesses and so on. So I think you have to take a broader focus and look at those things which are really valuable for human beings, namely the kind of life they can lead and the freedom to lead that kind of life rather than something mechanical like, say, income. Uh, you, you're, is it fair to suggest then that, that one of the failures uh, sometimes of theory is to simplify and to categorize in, a, in, in such a way as to narrow the focus which then denies one a, a richer understanding of the phenomenon in question? Something like that, but I won't say exactly that mm -hmm. because Ultimately, um, I think we have to simplify in order to have a comprehension. I think as T.S. Eliot, uh, mankind cannot 
bear too much reality. <laughs> I think it's probably right. But I think it's really, it really a choice of simplifications. Um, <laughs> because it, it's the kind of simplification which doesn't give us much understanding compared with the kind of simplification which will give us a lot of understanding. It's, that's what we are looking at, really. So quite often it ended up, I mean, if you look at the process of critique, you get a model which is by necessity, perhaps, a simplified representation of the world. You criticize it by saying, you don't, you're neglecting this, this is very important, you're leaving that out. And then it looks as if you're criticizing the simplification, which in a sense you are at that mm -hmm. moment. But then when you have really broadened your understanding, then you have a different life, life of theory, type of theory. And then, of course, in that theory, you're trying to simplify again so that the bigger understanding is comprehensible. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, you're looking for a different type of simplification. So ultimately, what begins as a critique of simplification mm -hmm. replaces one type of simplification by another. I think that's my little understanding, and <laughs> maybe very imperfect, of the process of critique and, and the re-emergent or emergence of an alternative way of understanding the phenomenon. So ultimately, simplification isn't an enemy, but uh, we have to really be concerned whether the simplification is of the right kind that, uh, you know, that would allow us to rest rather than uh, remain dissatisfied and keep keep um, hitting at it. Uh, in, in the battle for, uh, for redefinition, for resimplification, wh what are the, the wellsprings of, of creativity? Uh, what I cyclically are interested in, what, what, are, the, what are the roots, and, and there must be many, of, uh, of the search uh, for rethinking a problem. You mentioned that you were a political activist. I, I assume that protest uh, sometimes uh, is in the general environment, not necessarily on the part of the theorist, is something that changes our thinking uh, uh, in, in, the, in this evolution of ideas. For example, in the, in the case of the, the, the women's movement in the 60s, uh, called our attention uh, to, to many, of, of, uh, many phenomena that, that had been ignored. I think that's absolutely right. Um, I think protest is uh, very important. Um, I, I'm a great believer in the power and reach of public reasoning, and protest is one way of, uh, of engaging in public reasoning. Um, it's not the only way, because you could also have a uh, debate, which is not a protest, but an argument. Mm -hmm. uh, so one would not like to confine oneself to the, act, to the sphere of protesting only. On the other hand, protestation could be both important in terms of what it's immediately trying to achieve, as well as the, the kind of broadening of vision that it may bring about. Now, just to take two examples, you mentioned the, uh, the feminist movement. And certainly, the feminist movement um, has been one of the more creative things happening across the world, and quite a lot of it in this country. Um, the, I think what it was doing was to question quite a lot of the standard presumptions about the nature of society that existed. I think beginning with the family. I mean, family is, uh, is an arrangement where the divisions of the fruits of living together um, are determined by certain uh, established customs. And, you know, that the women tends to cook, can take a job if she can combine it with the household work as well, mm -hmm. and so on, which is the standard thing. And this has become so, had become so st standard and had gone on for such a long time that people may not even recognize that there was anything special about it. So I think you need some kind of a, um, a, a kind of intervention of a thought, uh, of it, of which is not a um, a, a protesting thought, which is not a, a, a just a, a, a kind of confirmation of what's going on, which says, why should it be the case that this is so? Similarly, whether the feminist cause is just one where the women could pursue, mm -hmm. or the feminist cause is something which is a broader perspective, which takes on an approach to underdogs in general. I was one of the 
founding members of the uh, of the uh, association of feminist economists uh, though i'm uh, indubitably a man and and the uh, but i didn't think any contradiction in that because it seemed to be a cause that's uh, that's of great importance to take another example, I was um, in some ways lucky in being in this campus where I'm now this sitting down with you today, mm -hmm. namely at Berkeley, in 64-65, which was a year of, uh, as you might recollect, free speech movement and a lot of things happened. And I found it uh, both an, a very exciting thing to watch. I was a very young faculty member at that time. Mm -hmm. But I was also, I think, learned a lot both from the way the organization of the student movement went, which was very different from anything I was involved in, in, say, Calcutta, where my own political teeth had been cut in Presidency College, where I did take part in student political activities. But also, there were, I think, a kind of transformation of understanding in this form. I mean, for example, before I came to Berkeley in 64, I would have thought that there were these different trends, different things going on. There was the movement about racial justice, African-Americans, uh, and that issue, Hispanics too, but African-Americans mostly. Then there was also the issue of the rich and the poor. And then there was an issue of the organizationally, you know, the corporate society mm -hmm. versus the individual. The bureaucratization uh, of the university. Bureaucrat the organization of the world. Yeah, yeah, right. And I thought of them as separate things. And one of the re more remarkable things about the free speech movement, and I think to a great extent it's the vision of the student leadership, is to be able to draw on all these simultaneously, which did not seem to me to be very possible. I mean, mm. certainly standard left-wing politics of the kind that Europe and Asia knows seemed unlikely to get very far in the United States, given the political mm. territory in this country and the, the morbid fear of, of communism and so on, mm -hmm. which dominated American thinking at that time. And that seemed to restrain things. Now, of course, at that time, the fact that the Soviet Union itself was going through great turmoil uh, really helped to broaden the perspective to say that Really, that's not what the debate is about. The debate is about equity, about attention, about the importance of the persons in the society and not just of, of, of corporations and institutions. And in some ways, the mixing of these, the, mm -hmm. the mixing is probably not the right word, the integration of these concerns came to me as quite an insight, a social insight, which I think directly emanated, not from my reading of books, but from my observing of what was going on in this rather unruly days in the campus. It was certainly unruly, <laughs> there's no question. A lot of classes were lost, and for a teacher that's always somewhat sad. Uh, but what I was learning, of course, was, was dramatically important. So I think you're absolutely right that protests could be a way of opening up the mind and which could really broaden one's understanding in a very big way. Mm -hmm. Another uh, theme that, that I find in, in my limited reading of your work is uh, the openness to diversity and alternative experiences uh, as, a, as another uh, source, a wellspring of, of new ways of examining uh, theories and uh, launching them, them on, the, on this path of resimplification, rethought, and so on. Talk a little about that, because I know uh, in, in a number of pieces that you wrote in the New York Review book, which I read, th this theme comes up. Oh no, there was uh, democracy in India or, you know, in China in, in very early periods. So this, in a way, goes along with a, a, a commitment to an existing theory that's, that's inadequate, basically, because of its point of reference. Yeah. I think I've only very kind of you to, to, to say what you're saying. Uh, certainly it's been my um, uh, ambition to bring in more, a broader perspective in many cases. Um, the, I think the, what, what happens is that we tend to get um, um, structured into thinking in certain ways. 
and and when they work, they work very well to some extent. It's like what you see in say Agatha Christie detective stories. If you find that a, a, a style of doing crime works very well, <laughs> then you go on repeating it. <laughs> so that's how you're easy to identify. But uh, that applies not only to crime but also to creative work. That if once it works well, then we like repeating it. Uh, the person who was very good, and for me, was a shaft of light, uh, through a shaft of light, is Adam Smith. And uh, this is in a different context, in a moral context, but the same thing applies to the, to the pursuit of knowledge. Um, uh, you know, he has this notion of the impartial spectator. And he talks about why understanding of justice requires you to bring people from distant, hmm. distant from the, you have to imagine what it would look like to people who are far away. And he gives us an example that even the very clever, very humane people have tended to accept certain things, which would be hard for them to accept, ex accepting that it had become so standard in the society in which they live that they don't question it. One of his examples is Aristotle and Plato, along with all other uh, ancient uh, Greeks and Athenians, actually thought there was nothing particularly wrong with infanticide. Mm -hmm. Now, that is, it may seem mm. abnormal to us. On the other hand, they lived in a society in which that was standard practice. And given that, and given the fact that you come to accept standard practice, they did not apply their critical mind, which they were applying to almost everything else, to this issue. And the way to ask it, uh, Adam Smith thought, is to be, would have been for them to ask, does every society have it? And if other mm -hmm. societies exist, they don't, why not? And in some ways, as you put it, you need a vision from a distance to look at that. This is a subject mm. of some importance right now in the United States, given the divided judgment in the Supreme Court about juvenile capital punishment. Uh, one of the points of disagreement seems to have been, I mean, I think the, the primary debate, of course, is about whether the, is the, the whether uh, executing um, uh, the, uh, people for having committed a murder when they were juvenile could, uh, would appear to be cruel and unusual punishment. Now I think the division isn't between the two sides that they think that you have to bring in foreign perspectives. Uh, I think the claim of the majority is that in fact within the domestic perspective it appears wrong. But in trying to understand how the domestic hmm. examination would go, there is a considerable interest on the part of the, of the five who voted on one mm -hmm. side, uh, of whom actually I know only one uh, reasonably well, that's Justice Blair. Uh, there is a great deal of interest in, in the way the world thinks about it. So it's not so much, as in, I think as Justice Kelly has said, in trying to do what others want us to do. It's trying to, as it were, broaden your own understanding by seeing what things look like from the perspective of others. And then come back to ask the question, what we as Americans ought to do now. I think Smith was saying something like that. He was mm. criticizing Plato and Aristotle for not doing it for here, but doing it for other subjects. Yeah. So I think to some extent the same thing applies in the academia too, that we get used to a, you know, a certain economic model is successful. Uh, we can explain market behavior and a lot of other things that way. And then we stick to it. And then the question might be, do we have to do it like that? Now, if in this case it's not another country, but if in another discipline, they don't think that way, then you may say, well, might there be something to learn from that? So it's that view from distance uh, that is, uh, you know, you have to place yourself at a certain distance to do it, is I think the, the phrase that, that Smith uses. I think that's quite important, not just for morality and politics, but also for epistemology and science. And I think um, to some extent that has been, um, you know, I felt at least uh, enthused by whether or not I've been successful in doing it. You referred particularly to the issue of democracy. I think the it's quite standard now in political philosophy to understand democracy to be not just voting, but public reasoning, mm -hmm. government by discussion, I think John Stuart Mill's phrase. That is very standard. 
Now, then if you're looking at the history of democracy, you look not only at the history of balloting, you also look at the history of public discussion. And that you find all over the place, from India, Japan, uh, you know. I quote Mandela from his uh, native village mm -hmm. in Africa and so on. So you have to look at the history in a different light to understand uh, democracy and asking such question as to whether democracy can be quote-unquote imposed on other societies as if these societies never had a tradition of public discussion, which is just not true. It's not true of the Middle East. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, after all, uh, there were very considerable public discussion on, on these matters in Iraq, in, um, in, in Egypt, in, in, in uh, Turkey, in 9th century Muslim Cordoba in Spain, or in India, um, when Akbar the Mughal emperor was lecturing on the need for tolerance and for dialogue between different religious uh, members of different religions. It was, he was giving these lectures at the same time when Giordano, Giordano Bruno was being hanged in Rome for heresy. Uh, and, and so if one were to look at it at that moment, there's much more tolerance in Agra than there is in Rome at that moment. And it's not the picture mm -hmm. that the West has a kind of uh, the monopoly of, of having taught in a tolerant, liberal way, and the uh, East has not. So I think that requires a really big revision, I think. Mm -hmm. there, there, you're touching on a very interesting subject, which is the, the relation of theory and truth to power, because it, it would seem that power, uh, uh, as it moves toward illegitimacy, does, uh, narrows the base of information. Uh, I, I'm, I'm uh, just as a, as a response to after reading your work that that you, you've touched on this this notion of we've touched on on freedom and on no, uh, the notion of democracy which are now uh, 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 reputed to be major goals for example of US foreign policy but in fact the the definition of, of, of freedom and democracy are, are very narrow ones that limit the information about different ways of, of thinking about uh, the concept. Uh, so, so what does this tell us anything about the, the relation of, of theory and truth to power? Does, what, what, what can lead power to incorporate new visions uh, and not to limit information? That, that must happen mm -hmm. sometimes. I think the connection between um, power and understanding is quite important, I agree. I think there is also a danger in, in making, uh, a, a, a making into a theory something which um, claims much more than is true. So I think mm -hmm. one has to be, watch the rhetoric of power. As you know, the rhetoric of power has been widely used in, in the social science and sociology in particular. Mm -hmm. Now, I think it's certainly true that power and knowledge is power too, is, is, is extremely important. And yet, it may generate the sense that if you don't have power, you cannot have any impact, which I think would be quite wrong. Mm -hmm. And even what we were discussing about protest, is protesting about the inequality of power and if you end up making an impact, well, you are making an impact because you went against power. Now, then you might say, somebody might square the circle by saying, of course, you had your power of protest. But that way, I mean, I don't think we are learning very much. We are just putting everything in the jargon of power. But if by power we mean established power, I think we have to see how important they are. And your example about the American role in foreign policy would be a good example of that. And at the same time, how it can be also challenged to take the view that since they have power, there's not a lot we can do, I think would be a great mistake. Mm -hmm. And um, I think in the context of this particular thing you're mentioning about democracy, uh, I mean, I, I, I like the rhetoric of the administration, the fact that they're committed to democracy, which wasn't the case earlier on. After all, this country had quite a lot of history of supporting anti-democratic movement, military governments, overthrowing legitimate democratic government, whether in Africa or Latin America, have often had support from the US government. The fact that democracy is accepted as an important uh, at least part of the rhetoric 
of, of the administration, in my judgment, is positive. But then there's a question as to how we should understand democracy. And I think here there are three things. One is that to see democracy just as balloting would be a great mistake. That's not mm -hmm. what the subject is about. I don't think political philosophers anymore think that that's all that is, that is involved. And if you take, for example, Iraq, it's not just a question of organizing the balloting, but also how much public discussion there could be, whether you can have the balloting without banning Al Jazeera from reporting in Iraq, and whether the different political parties can express their views without putting it in, in some kind of religious vocabulary of being a Shiite or a Sunniite. Can they raise the kind of broader question that the rest of the world often bring out? So there is that issue. There is also the issue about to what extent the, uh, the organization of um, political discussion can be done without the kind of militarist atmosphere in which Iraq inescapably is now involved, mm -hmm. given the way the thing went. I mean, uh, the error about um, uh, uh, the weapons of mass destruction, uh, we can go on arguing, you know, how, uh, how dreadful that error was. But the fact of the matter is that we are now in a situation mm -hmm. where you can't think of Iraq excepting in, 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 in a kind of form where the military presence and violence all around is, is very big. And the third thing is not to think of the world only in terms of Iraq. There's a whole lot of things mm -hmm. about democracy in the world that one has to think about. And one would need more commitment, not just in Middle East like Saudi Arabia, but also in Africa, the commitment after all during the Cold War years, both the Soviet Union and the United States have supported a lot of military dictatorship and the inheritance of that could be seen in Africa even today. Uh, what are these countries? The Soviet Union is gone mm -hmm. and Russia is a kind of pale successor to that. But what is the United States going to do in order to undo the, mm -hmm. the, the mischief of the Cold War which visited Africa in a big way? I think these are the kind of issues to mm -hmm. be raised. Now, I think if it's being dominated by one line of thinking in the administration, that reflects the, what you were saying about the importance of power. But on the other side, to say, therefore, we have had it, I think it's a great mistake. I think if we have a different view, we ought to express it. If Europeans think differently, they ought to express what their views are. If others, Japanese, Indians, others think differently, we ought to express our view and have a public discussion. After all, public discussion has had a considerable effect on, on even on the U.S. policy mm -hmm. in, in making the administration decide what is it that they can do and what is it that they cannot do, even though they're immensely more powerful than any other country in the world. So that there is the danger in the rhetoric of power of being too fatalistic to, and, and too accepting uh, of the, uh, the ex, you know, the, the going too gently uh, into the uh, into the into the debate. I think I think we have to vigorously engage in these debates whenever we disagree. Mm -hmm. And you make the point. Uh, I noticed in one piece that I read comparing uh, uh, China and India of of the importance that. Uh, a, a, a broader definition of democracy, uh, a reasoned discussion, uh, can be to the process of development, actually. Uh, I, I recall that you, you make the point That's of... That's right. I, I, do, I do discuss that. You know, China has been, of course, immensely successful mm -hmm. as an economy, mm -hmm. and India is learning a lot from China. China has been visionary in two different ways. I think, uh, and both these happened without democracy, in, in the government. but. The, the Chinese Revolution brought in what was, after all, a popular movement, namely the Communist Movement. And the Chinese, with, uh, one must give them credit where it's due, went in for basic expansion of basic education, basic health care, in a way that India didn't do at all. And, it, and it's not altogether independent of democracy in the sense it seems peculiar to think that the communist movement is a product of democracy, but after all the communist movement was a popular movement and they were replacing a, a, a less popular government. But then uh, that commitment did produce a lot of results uh, and in some ways the Chinese were doing well 
on the basis of this much more than the Indians uh, were mm -hmm. doing, despite the fact the Chinese also had a famine, 5961, in which 30 million people died, which India did not have. But in terms of, if you look at the trend of progress, education and healthcare led to all, all kinds of improvement. By the time the economic reforms came in China in 79, the Chinese had a life expectancy advantage over India of 14 years. The mm -hmm. Chinese life expectancy was 68, India was 54, and they were doing very much better. Then came the economic reforms, and it cured one of the big problems of China, namely utterly counterproductive economic system. And then the Chinese economy started growing very well, very fast, and faster than almost anywhere in the world. Uh, but one of the interesting things is that, despite that, in this period, uh, even though the uh, Chinese uh, gap between the Chinese and Indian income had grown, India had grown fast too, like 6-7%, but the Chinese 9, 10 percent has actually taken it much further ahead. The gap between China and in India has grown in per terms of per capita income. But in the space of life expectancy, mm. it's halved. In fact, life expectancy has grown fast, three times as fast in India as in China. And it's also the gap in infant mortality redu uh, reduced if you take some parts of India, which combines democracy with uh, with the Chinese type of commitment to the poor, which put the China ahead, China ahead of India in the first place, like Kerala. You see that the Kerala's achievement of life expectancy is dramatically higher than that of China. Similarly, infant mortality in the, at the time of economic reform, uh, Chinese and the uh, Kerala uh, both had uh, infant mortality rate of 37 per thousand. Now the Chinese have come down from 37 to 30, where Kerala has gone from 37 to 10. And one has to ask, what is it that the Indians are doing right? Because if you go around, and I have written on that, uh, there are dreadful things happening in India. Why is it that still uh, it's going like that? It would seem to appear that something more dreadful is happening in China for this gap to be reduced in this way. And I think what's happening is I think China is paying a heavy price for not having democracy. Because in order to have constantly good health care, you need public criticism so that the, the hospital services are criticized. Um, you can't have a situation when a SARS epidemic could surface in November and be kept under a lid following April. I think you need openness, which a democracy provides. But the other big thing is that when China had economic reform in 79, one of the first things they did, and being a non-democratic country, it could do it like a drop in a drop of a hat, is to abolish public health insurance and so that you have to buy your private health insurance. China is one of the few countries in the world today where you actually have to buy your vaccines. Mm -hmm. And it's a situation where you can't imagine a democratic country where public health insurance, which is accepted and agreed and going on, it's suddenly dropped. It can only happen in a, in a, in a country with, with one-party politics. And I think China has paid a very heavy fly, a price. If the Chinese life expectancy growth has dramatically slowed down, infant mortality rates have stagnated. It's to a great extent concerned with the, with the absence of democracy in China, which both allowed public health insurance to be abolished and eliminated, as well as does not subject to the health service, to the constant criticism. We know how dreadful the Indian health service is, but the saving grace is exactly that we do know it. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of public discussion. There is constantly question. Why shouldn't the government resign? Why should they, shouldn't they do something? I think that's very important, uh, not just in preventing famines and big disasters on which I've written earlier, but also in continuing progress of healthcare, longevity, and quality of life. Uh, one, one final question uh, related to the to looking at your life in a broad perspective and, and the, the the richness and the depth of the ideas that you've grappled with and this is only an hour conversation we can't uh, do justice to the body of your work and, and, and the beautiful clarity with which your writings uh, 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 come to us. Uh, what advice would you give students uh, who are planning for their future about the kind of preparation that should go in 
to uh, uh, their education uh, if they want to uh, train for the kind of theorizing we've been talking about, which is which is really uh, both you know interdisciplinary, but also questioning uh, categories and reshaping them and redefining. Them. Any thoughts of advice for students? Well, I'm not a great one to give advice <laughs> at the general <laughs> level, I think. I, I, I get very engaged in advising students. I'm very mm -hmm. proud of the fact that I've had some really brilliant students over the 120 or so people who have done PhD with me. And uh, you know, some of them have done much more brilliant work than I have. But the, I, I take it you're really thinking about the social science, mm -hmm. the humanities, yes, yes, yeah, the yeah. natural sciences. I wouldn't even pretend to to have any advisory role to give. Uh, I think this, uh, the need to question is, is, is a big one. I mean, that's so trite that I hesitate to mention it. Mm -hmm. um, but you see, I think the reason why it's worth mentioning it is that sometimes the discipline of the, of the subject, as well as the academia, tend to discourage that. It's much easier to publish papers, for example, on a well-known subject. If you look at economics, you will find that the contributions come in kind of clusters. Hmm. There, was a, there was a decade when everyone seemed to be discussing about the, what the optimal size and shape of cities would be. Eventually, I don't think it left much impact on city planning. I don't think mm -hmm. if you talk with city planner, I don't think you would typically get the idea that they got a tremendous amount from these modeling of, of, of optimal cities that were done in economics. But one reason why it happened is that, you know, while, while something is going on and one or two famous names are written on it, very easy to get a paper published criticizing a little, changing a little, vacuum mm -hmm. cleaning something which had not been done, etc. I think to resist that may be quite useful from a long-run point of view. I mean, there have been such great um, thinkers, uh, you know, who have done that. I mean, that has been the tradition. Um, I mean, that applies to all the big names we are talking about. But even among contemporaries, if I talk, for example, of my friend George Akerlof, he's an economist who is here. I think one of the reasons why he has been so productive is because he has always questioned things mm -hmm. right from the beginning that, uh, you know, you say that this is the standard way things happen. Doesn't seem to me so, why not this? And then he tried uh, to go into the second phase, which we were discussing, questioning one kind of simplification, but then trying to get a structure, system, an analytical rigor, which allows it to understand, communicate, appreciate, fathom in a, in a simple way, an alternative modeling. So I think the, that kind of, um, Willingness to question is important, and it, it, it's it's trite. But the, the, given the fact that quite often academia will encourage people to go in the direction of the easy success, which is quick publication on some established subject using established methodology, just completing the story. You have done the north, south, and west corner. Let me do the east, <laughs> and that's, mm -hmm. that's one more paper. And that goes in, and it adds to your cur curriculum, and you might actually move forward quite rapidly uh, early in life, and that's not to be scoffed at. But I think the need to be skeptical even of the pressure of the academia and of the pressure of the department head. And I might say, even though I've had good students and given them advice, to be skeptical sometimes of the advice that you get from your advisor, like <laughs> me, <laughs> I think, <laughs> was very important, including this applies to the very advice I'm giving right now. <laughs> uh, Professor Sen, thank you very much for uh, taking the time uh, to be with us today. It, it's, it's been a real honor to talk uh, a little about your uh, intellectual odyssey. Thank well, you. Well, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.